Hello, my name is Michael Blackburn. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm one of the staff members here. And no matter when you're watching this, it could be early in the morning on Sunday, it could be in the afternoon. It might be four years from now, but we are glad you're joining us in worship today. I'm here with my friend Gregory and Ian. Ian Smith um, is just taking a role here at First United Methodist Church. He's going to be leading up a lot of our programs that, that, that outreach into the community, a place where we get to um, fit the needs that the community have, but also have a threshold for them to be introduced to the life of our church. We're here in our after school. If you need to know more about what's going on with us and your first time here, look in the description, sign up so we can know more about you and we can let you know more about us. But again, today's the day the Lord has made. Let's worship again. Amen. Almighty God, long ago you spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, you have spoken to us by a Son, whom you appointed heir of all things, through whom you also created the worlds. At this time of year, we want to focus our attention and adoration on the Christ child in the manger. It is your prophets who continue to call us to attention to the one foretold who now has come. The prophet's words to us this day are words of warning, urging us to be prepared, to be ready for his presence among us. Help us to hear those who prepare us for the way of the Lord. Guard us against the false prophets who would lead us astray, those who sow hatred instead of love, those who promise ease and luxury and prosperity rather than challenge and danger and difficulty, those who promise the wide road rather than the narrow one. Prepare our hearts for this season that we may hear the story anew with fresh, renewed, and increased awareness of the import of his coming and adjust our lives accordingly with gratitude and thankfulness for the gift you have given us. This we pray, in the name of the one who came and dwelt among us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's get ready, the Savior's coming. Sing Alleluia, sing glory to God. Let's get ready, the Savior's coming. Sing Alleluia, sing glory to God. Hi, I'm unpacking the Christmas things that I packed up at the end of Christmas last year. And I'm opening and thinking about all the different memories I've had when I look at these things. I've got some special things that I've collected over the years. For example, this is a Matryoshka doll that Jane Baker gave me years ago. And children just love playing with this and I love playing with it. It has Joseph and Mary, a wise man and um, a shepherd. And in the middle, if we didn't lose it, is a tiny little baby Jesus. And here are the manger scene people that I put up that any children that come to my house can play with because they're not breakable, they're wooden. Aren't they really cute? Betty Lou Hubbard painted these for me years ago, and it has been played with by many, many children over the years. Doesn't break, it's wooden. Oh, and this one. This is my favorite. This right here is it is my Christmas bell of joy. I have had this for a long, long time, and it's been a Christmas bell of joy for many generations. And it is the most beautiful sounding bell. It just fills you with joy and happiness when you hear it ring. It is just the most beautiful. Would you like to hear it? Let's let's uh let's see. I, you're not gonna believe how pretty this is. Well, wait a minute. This is my Christmas bell of joy. It rang last year. Huh. I wonder what's going on. Oh, I know. It's not Christmas, it's Advent. And this bell won't ring until Christmas Day. Advent is the four Sundays that we spend waiting for Christmas Day. Sometimes it's hard to wait, but let's, it's a good thing and let's practice it a little bit. Um, let's be like this bell. Let's sit still and quiet, real still, and let's think about the love and the joy and the anticipation that we feel during Advent. Are you ready? Real still. Let's go. Did you feel it? Did you feel the love all around you? This is Advent, and we are going to spend the next four weeks waiting for Christmas Day when we got the very best gift of all, the gift God gave us the baby Jesus, who would be the light of our world. There'll be hope in the morning on that day, for the daylight will dawn when the darkness is gone. There'll be hope in the morning on that day. We light this first candle that denotes hope. Our hope is in the Lord. 
Let us see the light and hear the hope that John's words give for us. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and unite the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so it begins. I saw him with my own eyes. I heard him. I was there. We've been waiting for this since like forever. My whole life in synagogue, I heard the rabbis chant uh, prophetic voices of hope. I'm sending my messenger ahead of you to prepare the way for you. I'm coming. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. A nation can't lose hope, the rabbis would say, even when hope seems lost. God is coming to shake the world, to, to, to turn it right side up. God's power will liberate us, and God knows we need to be liberated. I, I feel it as much as anybody. I live in the lower city, the, the city of David. It's, it's one of the oldest parts of Jerusalem. It's just south of the Temple Mount. It's a maze of dusty streets running up and down in every direction. My shop is in the open air. And it's there with other craftsmen, the, the weavers, dyers, um, potters, bakers, tailors, carpenters. I am a, a blacksmith, just like my father, just like his father before him. In our place, it's on the backside uh, of an old tavern. We'll make whatever you need. Uh, mostly farming tools, axes, winnowing forks, blades to cut the grain. Roman soldiers, they're always around. They don't need to come by my shop. I mean, Roman legions, they traveled with their own blacksmiths because they got it. They understood the importance of having them around, uh, not only to create new weapons and equipment uh, during the middle of a campaign, but also repairing all that stuff and maintaining all that stuff. They know how to win a fight, but still they come to my place. Sometimes they want me to make them a sword. Sometimes they want me to fix their broken one or fix a piece of armor. They need horseshoes. They need nails. They're always crucifying somebody. I don't want them around. They're not good for my business. Half the time they don't pay. But they, they go around abusing people, terrorizing people, threatening people for money. They remind us with their presence that we're occupied, that we're not free. Tax collectors too, like sometimes it's even our own people. They're bleeding us dry. Life down here is tough. And the farther you go down the hill, away from the temple, the poorer you get. But there's a buzz in the marketplace. A prophet, they say, John, the son of Zechariah. And I'm like, wait a minute. I remember the stories about him. I was young. Maybe it was 30 years ago. I was apprenticing for my dad. Um, Zechariah was the priest on duty. And the lot fell on him to enter the sanctuary to offer the, the incense. Man, 
something happened in there. There was a whole assembly of people that were gathered outside praying. They were waiting for him to come out, and he didn't come out. And when he finally came out, he couldn't speak. They knew he had seen a vision. They said, surely he saw a vision. He was wide-eyed. He was motioning with his hands. Eventually, the story got out. The angel Gabriel appeared to him in the temple. Gabriel, <laughs> the angel who stands in the very presence of God, said, even though you can't have a baby, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a baby. And you're going to name him John. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn people to the Lord their God. And get this, Gabriel says, with the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And from that day, because the angel Gabriel said so, John was set aside to be a Nazarite, which means he was to be fully devoted to God. He would live separately from society for the most part, like in the desert. He couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't trim his beard. He couldn't drink strong wine. Now, what they're saying out there is he's in the desert preaching. Some are saying he's not a beautiful candle burning softly in the sanctuary. He's a prairie fire, the very fire of God scorching the earth. He seems a bit off, <laughs> a wild man out in the wilderness. But that's not really surprising to me because the prophets, well, they've always been a bit out there, you know, like it seems back in the day, whenever you encountered a prophet or when someone encountered a prophet, Half the time they'd walk away saying, oh, he ain't right. <laughs> Wouldn't even listen to them. They seemed crazy, madmen. Like the prophet Isaiah, God instructed Isaiah to strip off his clothes and wander through Jerusalem naked and barefoot for three years. <laughs> Hosea, God tells Hosea to go marry a prostitute, and he does, and has three kids with her. Names all the kids' names that are judgment against the house of Israel. Their life becomes the story. Their life becomes the message. Ezekiel, Ezekiel eats a scroll. Um, he lays on one side for 390 days. He cooks his food over a fire of dung. He prophesies over dry bones that come to life, which is actually a prophecy of hope. But when you remember about this John, when he was born, what happened with his dad and all. Like, okay, we may not understand it completely, but what we do know is that something's going on and everybody's feeling it now. People are going out in droves to hear him preach, and there's lots of reasons why. People want to hear him rail against the Romans, rail against Herod. They, they want to hear him stick it to the man, you know? To hear him say, you brood of vipers, because that's what he's doing. There's a hunger among the people. There's, there's this angst. Even against God, it's like, how long, O oh Lord? How long? Where are you? When are you coming? Can't you see us? Now, John the Baptist is an unlikely voice. He's, he's a bit dramatic, you know, with locusts on his breath and honey on his lips. He he dresses like the prophet Elijah, and he preaches a message that we weren't expecting. Instead of raising an army and, and mounting a rebellion against the Romans, he calls for a different kind of revolution. Repent and be baptized, he says. Freedom comes through the water. Well, of course it does. We know the stories. We were slaves in Egypt and exiles in Babylon. We were brought through the Red Sea. Through the Sinai wilderness, we went through the Jordan into the promised land. And now, as I've kind of already alluded to, we're slaves in our own land. John is promising a new exodus, a new freedom. Prepare the way, he says. And so the crowds, they shout, what are we to do? What are we to do? And he says, if you have two of anything, share one of those things with the poor. If you have two coats, 
You don't need two coats. And if you have food, do the same. Soldiers came. Can you believe that? Roman soldiers came to hear this backwater voice. And even they gathered around and, and said, well, what are we to do? Don't be violent. Don't intimidate people. Don't extort money. Don't threaten or give false accusation. Be satisfied with your life. Be satisfied with your wages. Tax collectors came to be baptized. <laughs> Don't collect any more tax than is your due. Don't be corrupt. I heard him with my own ears. Prepare the way of the Lord. So what am I going to do? What are you going to do? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with God and with one another. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have not done your law. We have not heard the cry of the needy. God, you know we have not been faithful stewards of our creation, of all that you have entrusted to us. So our prayer is that you would forgive us Lord, that you would free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body, which is broken for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, the cup of salvation. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, he said, often in remembrance of me. And so as he shared with his disciples this last meal, as we remember it in this place, we remember the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Our prayer is that God will pour out God's Spirit on all of us gathered, gathered in this sacred space, and that God will pour out God's Spirit on the gifts of bread and wine that we have prepared in our sacred places in our homes. That God would Make us one with the Spirit, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. And this we pray with great love and great passion. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you. Amen.
We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation. Still
So thank you all for coming today. And as we go, may we go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and go in peace. Amen.